Hey everybody, thanks for watching. This is the Parkville, Mississippi. Say hi, Tony. Hey guys. Nice and hot down here, right in the middle of summer school session. What is the temperature there today? Uh, humidity is probably about 90 some percent, and <laughs> it's like 92 right now. Okay, so pretty swampy. Um, so so we're, we're going to talk in this video about a couple different things. I put up this video. I don't think, yeah, there's no way to, here, let me, let me do this. There's no way for me to show my screen, but I can do this. Um, I put up this video recently that you guys may have seen called, what was it called? Where is it? My videos. Here it is. All right, so I put up this video recently <laughs> called uh, In 2000 Tigers. And I wanted to do this live video today to go over some of the comments that we had. I want to make the channel very interactive. We love getting your questions and your comments. Yeah. And there were over... How many how many comments on this video there there are over 200 comments here on this wow. video but there's uh themes in in these comments that i wanted to go over with tony and also because we also got like about 450 new subscribers for, with the video so i wanted to introduce some of these concepts to you kind of uh from scratch so uh tony when when someone's let's go through some of these comments but one common theme that, that i saw was was um well if you look at the video tiger is in both videos tiger is going with his lower body first so they don't understand you mean the arms are going first yeah so unfortunately when we look at video that in, in our world that's the kinematics what we what we measure and and in any action motor action there is always this lower body than upper body than arms kind of a proximal to distal type motion but what we really need to understand is there's a lot of neural mechanisms behind that or underneath the skin in our brain in our body in our muscular system that actually drives differently and operates at a different sequence than what we see externally so it's kind of like saying you know uh I jump, so all the power comes from the ground, but really I'm using my muscles to push down the ground so I can go up. So a lot of it is kind of a misinterpretation of what motor control is really about. So like if we think of uh, uh, funny cars at, at the, the starting line and some, somebody could say, and you could even see a video say, hey, all the power is coming from the asphalt, but it's real because and that's true the car's not going to go anywhere without the ground but with but it's really not coming from yeah, yeah. exactly so if we, if we put something soft on our force plate well the, the amount and i jump and i land on this cushion of of rubber and i kind of squish in there the force plate doesn't give us the same reading that if if we took the cushion away and then landed on the force plate with our same body mass you know our body mass times gravity gives us our weight. Well, if I put a cushion there, that, that comes up a different number. I take the cushion away. So it's one of those things that's misinterpretation of scientific evidence in a sense, or kinematic evidence, because no one is looking. It's very difficult to read what's happening in the mind and what's happening in the body. Now, the good thing is with the muscular system, we can measure it through EMG, but th there's some noise there. So we just got to be real careful with that. But it's just kind of a, a misinterpretation that happens a lot in, uh, in especially in golf, but in a lot of sports. Okay, uh, one one question that we got um, that we got twice a uh, comment that we got twice was uh, a lot of stuff. Also in this video, this video was was not so much about the, the the dominance of either hand, but one of the things in reactionary golf. Tony does reactionarygolf.com uh, membership site there, okay. and also does a YouTube channel. And one of the things in reactionary golf, we talk about using the, the right side and the right arm adduction like this. Yep. And a lot, a lot of people were talking about, no, it's really a backhanded tennis motion. And that would have been a better example in your videos than that. So I'm going to bring on, uh, and Tony, talk a little bit about why you think it's a right-sided motion while I, I'm, I'm going to bring on a special guest here in a second. Well, being a, a graduate teaching assistant in kinesiology, I had the opportunity to actually 
teach tennis and worked with the, the MSU men's uh, tennis coach here, Matt Roberts, phenomenal player, phenomenal coach, took guys went to the NCAA, phen- just great season. And so, you know, the question always becomes, well, is it a right-handed or left-sided game and with tennis? And if you look at – got to be careful with tennis players because if you tell them what's your strongest shot or what's the strongest shot, they may say the backhand, but they use two hands with the backhand, but they only use one with the ground stroke. And so they're interpreting it as maybe they're more confident and stuff like that. But when we look at muscle activation, when we have a bent arm, that's a shorter moment arm. So now we can actually move that faster and that takes less effort. If I have a straight arm, this takes much more effort to move because the moment or the length off from the fulcrum is longer. So it takes more muscular effort. So there's kind of a, we got to be careful with that. But when you take a look at, any type of tennis motion, and I've done this for 20 some years with teaching juniors, ground strokes with tennis rackets, you know, or ping pong, you know, but the tennis racket is, is you look at that, uh, look at Maria Sharapova, anyone that has a great ground stroke, and you're going to see it looks like. Yeah. Mouth swing. Uh, hey, Tommy. Hi. Very good. All right, guys, on the line, I have. Hey, Tom, how are you doing, buddy? Good. I just want to make sure you guys can hear each other. All right, so uh, Tommy, we're talking a lot of comments in, in a video I just put up was that a lot and, um, I'm not sure how that uh, how that translates um, over the golf swing, but just uh, being it had a, being on your dominant side, um, and also a big thing is having you on the leg. Uh, a lot of the power comes from loading my right. I'm right-handed, loading the right leg uh, and and the right arm. Um, just having that be the, the more coordinated side definitely helps. Okay, so so Tommy, if somebody was just going to give you, let's say, a uh, hundred dollars per mile an hour, and you were you were going to hit a ball as hard as you could, would you do it backhanded or would you do it forehanded? That would be forehanded. And how how much? How many miles an hour more do you think your forehand? I'm sure they do this at Villanova. How many miles an hour more do you think your forehand is than your backhand on just like a, a regular ball? Um, probably uh, probably like seven to ten miles an hour harder on the forehand side. Okay, and then on all the the finesse shots that like we see Roger Federer doing, like you know the the drop shots and the real finesse shots, are you more accurate with those from a forehand side or from a backhand side? Or, or is it equal? Uh, it's, it's, it's probably more equal um, in that regard, but I think probably the hardest shot in tennis would be like a, a high backhand volley, just mm-hmm. reaching across um, with, with, your, with your hand, but having to play it on the, on the non-dominant side is it, definitely a, a really high skill shot. Okay, okay. So, Tony, does that seem like that kind of lines up with the philosophy of what you teach golfers? Well, exactly. And if we look at the EMG, and I haven't – well, actually, I've done some EMG. I haven't done the work research on EMG tennis, but when we look at some of the research, uh, it's coming a lot from the PAC, serratus anterior, which when they do the EMG in the golf swing, and I've done some, um, is it's definitely coming from the pectoral uh, muscles to be able to have that a deduction. So to me, that's obviously exactly right in line. Obviously, it's the reason why he's playing tennis at Villanova. So thanks. when we see, in golf anyway, the golf data, which is probably not too different from a tennis swing. Tony, is the power in the golf swing coming from the legs? No, unfortunately, Tommy, that I will uh, have to disagree with you. Even from a tennis perspective, the legs are very important. So let's not let's not separate them. We can't separate our arms from our body, and we don't want to. We we need pure muscle coordination. So the question is, what are the role of the legs versus the role of the arms? Role of the legs are to kind of help, help shift the mass and create stability and create posts so that we can use the upper body and the arm swing to create the speed. Um, and I don't know, Brendan, if you shared with Tommy the, the analysis I did with uh, Maria Sharapova, ground stroke versus Tommy's golf swing. Um, but you would see, uh, and I bet you, Tommy, if we pulled out your ground stroke video, we would see a totally different motion with your ground stroke versus your golf swing because of um, not your fault of, of, of yours, because just the perceived 
concept of how to swing a golf club and coming from the ground. Obviously, in tennis, there's much more reaction to it, but that's really where we want you to play golf to also. Okay, so here, Tommy and And that's what we see a lot with golfers. They're trying to drive the legs, but that doesn't move the golf club. The, the, the pelvis and the muscular structure of the hips has some momentum to the upper torso, but it doesn't drive the arms. So when we take a look at that, we, we want that set more of a solid base that Maria has. And that's what we would want in your golf swing, Tommy, is you're, in a sense, you're used to all your legs, but you're not moving the golf club. You know, and I know with, with what I've heard Coach uh, Matt talk about is, the, the, you know, getting the racket on the ball or what do we want the racket to do to create the shot to react to it. And then almost using that, then in reverse, the body then has to do something. And that's the approach I use with, with golf. And so from that point, especially then if you go to impact, Brendan, the next frame, next couple frames over, you're going to see how, again, how active your lower body is, but it's not, the club is way behind. Forces. Yeah. Yeah. So with the forces now, with the lower body is actually causing that club to move up. And I believe, Tommy, it looks like you kind of top that shot. But that's a good example. That's what I love to see is the, the, the miss hits, you know, versus look how more, more kind of level and stable. The upper body is still rotating with the ground stroke, but it's hitting into that strong left side. And that's really what, you know, being a great tennis player like you are, give me that right arm ground stroke with the golf swing. Don't worry about the lower body. Be athletic and let it go. And you would see your golf swing totally improve. Do beyond the, the science, what would be a good drill for Tommy to take um, – back to New Jersey and, and actually work on? I would take a look at the left-hand grip. You definitely do have a very strong left-hand grip. So I'd probably neutralize that a little bit. And I'd work just simply on hitting balls feet together, you know, and it's potential. I saw this with Coach Roberts. He has a big in-to-out or in-to-up type golf swing because that's what he does with tennis. So I would take a look at the path and make sure the path is not too much inside-out, which would, again, both of those creates the big hook. How does that sound, Tommy? Does that sound just totally opposite of what you were thinking or, or makes sense? No, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense. Um, I think some evidence that might uh, help support that also is the, uh, with a little bit of a shoulder turn. Um, like you'll see the best players, the, the guys who really rip the ball on the tennis court, uh, can keep their shoulders turned as long as possible, which definitely um, does not relate to the legs. And, and, and like Tony said, that's, that's what gets the racket or the, or the club moving. Yeah. So that's good. I'm, I'm glad I got something to take home with us. <laughs> yeah. So feet together, Tommy, and and do that for a little while and send us an update um, and let us yeah, know sure. how it goes. All right. All right, Tommy, I'll send you this with this little uh, comparison video. Thanks so much and say hi to Appreciate your mom. Appreciate it, Tommy. I will. Thanks for having me. All right. Good luck for at the internship. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Probably not connected, but maybe. It, uh, <laughs> Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods have decided to do a one-on-one -on -one match, winner take all, $10 million at Shadow Creek in Las Vegas. So it is going to be broadcast. They're actually trying to figure out who the broadcast partner is going to be. I think at first they were thinking, maybe thinking pay-per-view, but I think it uh, has such interest that they're going to get either ESPN or TBS or I guess there's a lot of people that would be interested in putting that on. Um, let's handicap this match a little bit. Tony. So they're going to be playing. It's not going to be like Tiger Woods 2000 versus Phil 2005. It's going to be like today, you know? Yeah. So we have to think about how they're playing now, how they're playing going into it, who's, uh, who's kind of heating up and who's cooling off. And really, if you had to put your money on it, what you think the match would finish at. It, uh, the cool thing about it is that it's going to be $10 million and $0 to the loser. Uh, although I'm sure they'll, they'll find a way to cut them in somehow. But yeah, yeah. what's your initial impressions on this one? Well, yeah, I agree. It would have been nice to have this 10 years ago. But, um, you know, I, I, you look at the ratings. I mean, for example, when you did the video with Tiger, look how that jumps up. And Tiger just moves the needle. So I think it's great to see him back playing again. Uh, from a golfing standpoint, I'm a big Tiger fan uh, on the golf course. So... I, I'm, I'm going to kind of go with Tiger, and I don't know, are they doing match play or are they doing stroke play? I, I think I'm almost positive it's going to be stroke play. I think it's going to be in the vein of Shell's wonderful world of golf. Plus, um, they want to see all 18 holes. So if somebody's up by, you know, they're not going to want to have to quit after 14 holes. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I think Tiger's more kind of on the, the trending upward. You know, I, I think the more he plays, you know, the, the, he's just going to keep getting better and better because I think he's got – I think he's physically in a better shape to do it. Nothing, I love Phil Mickelson. He's been great for the game. But I think physically, as as we get older, and I, you know, look at the workout. Uh, Tony, I think your AirPods just died. They just died. That's okay. Uh, okay, so here we go. But we're still here. Um, so I just think that Tiger is actually on an upward trend in playing performance. And I think Phil's kind of just – he's just floating along which isn't a bad thing. He's still a great golfer, still one of the greatest ever to play. So I'm going to kind of give the, the nod to Tiger on this one. Okay, I'm going to go the other way. I think Phil Mickelson will win. Uh, I don't think it'll be – I don't think it'll be that exciting of a match, actually. Um, I, I, I think for sure they're going to do it at a golf course. They're going to do it – first of all, the, th the reason I like Phil for this match is Phil is – Definitely like a desert. Um, I do understand your reservations about picking Phil because almost always, even throughout his whole career, he's always started hot in a season. Like I think every major he's won, he's he's won before in the season. Right. Always had a really great West Coast swing, win, winning at Pebble Beach, winning at uh, L.A., winning at Waste Management. And then he kind of fizzles out throughout the year, and that's probably the, uh, a fitness issue uh, more than anything. Uh, it really depends on who takes this. Uh, seriously the most, but I think Phil, because we, we have seen Phil Mickelson, and I think it's a big difference. We have proven it to himself that he can still do that. I think for Nike and everything else, that was really huge. The very next week, I think Tiger finished T2, or or he had a very close chance to win. That was going to be a big deal, but uh, Tiger is, like, it seems every tournament he plays, he's striking the ball better, and he's getting in less and less trouble, but um when it comes down to it, I think this is more of a gambler's mentality and less of a um, major tournament mentality. And Phil would uh, be the ultimate gambler. It's in Las Vegas. It's other things like that. Tiger, I think, will be the uh, the money favorite for sure. But I think Phil is going to actually uh, Phil will actually walk away winning it. And it'll seventy five percent of the time you're just walking in between shots. Right. So entertainment wise, how do you think they'll they'll the producers will overcome this well i'm hoping i remember watching some video i think it was rory and tiger and i can't remember who else was over in china or or in the far east and and that was great they have to have them mic'd up there has yeah to be that's in the that's in the uh that's in the deal was yeah. reported that they will be um, mic'd up you know it, it's going to be somewhat toned down i think because i you know i think they really can't say what they want to say you know, it's like if the NBA and NFL actually recorded all the things on the field, you know, especially the NBA where you can get some of that trash talking and stuff like that. Well, all their mic'd up segments get, yeah, all their mic'd up segments get reviewed by the league before they get released. So all, all, all anything interesting, you don't, you're not really hearing. Um, and you know, that's the thing. Like I know when I had uh, a couple months to play with uh, Michael Jordan, the trash talking in between the round it was really. His way, of, I mean, and he would do it, I mean, like to the moment, right right before you're ready to, to take a club back. So that type of mentality, I'll be curious to see if Phil does that to Tiger, you know, um, it's kind of like the old Trevino. I remember, and this goes back, where Trevino put in like a rubber snake, I think in like in Nicholas's bag at some playoff or something like that. Yeah, um, I don't mm -hmm. know, sorry. it was at, yeah. at, at Marion and at the U.S. Open. It was like the final round too. It was a very important right. round to go. Yeah. So you know, and I think that that's the sort of thing. That's the reason why I say I think you probably you could be right on that with Phil doing it because if he takes it with that mentality, he's going to be. It's you know, he's got the money in the bank already, and now he can just go out and play golf and have fun with it and, and really see if he can get it underneath Tiger's skin. Um, yeah, and if we look at, like, back in, not Ben Hogan, because he took everything pretty serious. But at the time, they uh, people maybe were thinking, oh, this is just a lark, or this is, um, you know, this is a, just a fun thing to show other people. But now, 50 years later, that has become the, like, the number one evidence that, that people are getting for 
you know, you hear a lot of stories, but I mean, to actually see it whole by whole in living color and everything else is a lot different. So that's what uh, one PGA Tour player, 70 years, the uh, FedEx Cup champion 2013 could be like such an amazing big deal. And who knows, British Open champion could be like not a big, I mean, look at uh, Bobby Jones's time. The Grand Slam has a totally different uh, rotation, almost totally different rotation between then and now. So, um, so this, I, even though they're taking it, the, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun for everybody. I would recommend hey, this. This could be a, a very big legacy thing for both of them. So, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, it's it's genuine. That to me is the biggest thing. Is if they can make it genuine, then it'll be a good show. Yeah. All right, so let's go to your questions, guys. Put any questions you have in the comments below. We have some coming in already. Um, Tony, this is something we just talked about, overdrawing with the arm swing. So he's swinging with his arms, but he tends to overdraw 25 yards left of his target. Uh, he's using the GC2. Okay, I start, so he yeah, starts the ball. You're right. Is he creating too much of a difference in face path? Yeah, it sounds like it. So the thing is, it's we got to put the whole thing together. So let's take a look at the whole motor control sequence. So it's an arms, body, and club, the ABC type of sequence. So the body has to work through impact. So there's a couple things that happen. Some people just eliminate the body completely and, you know, and don't move it. So then if, if the arms are swinging, there's got to keep that momentum going. There's going to be face rotation. So realize that the body does have to move at the right time. So with the, the foresight stuff, yeah, check your path. We only want one zero to three degrees in either direction to be your path. Well, that's such a small amount um, that we got to think of everything being more straight. So now if you get five or six degrees into out and you got the face square to the target, now that is actually a closed club face and the ball is going to hook off the planet. So that's the, the concern. So that's the, the concern is making sure that the path is correct and a lot of times people will actually feel that, hey, I'm, I feel like I'm all hands down at the bottom. Well, and what that is, is the body's already raced in transition. It has to stop to wait for the arms and club, just like Tommy's swing. And what is he going to do at the bottom? He has to flash it with his hands. And the only way to do that is to go from an open face to flip it over to square up the face. And that then end up produces an extra hook. So um, I have been working on a Flamingo 2.0 drill that the inside of the golf lab members already have about how to use your arm swing, how to get the fade. And it's, to me, it's, it's been a conversation of uh, looking, looking at Hogan's swing and looking at Sneed's swing. It's a modified version that the arm swing is on the functional swing plane. And then there's zero shaft rotation. So there is no hook and you can actually hit fades from that too. Yeah. We're going to have to get more detailed into that because we'll see the reactionary golf masterclass where we really talk a lot about what starts the downswing and uh, in your opinion, Tony, in a general way, what do you think? I, I think the best way to, to, to describe it, because everyone could be different. Okay. Cause we all have different tendencies. Think of, of this. We have two planes and they're going to stay in formation. They're going to bank. doesn't matter which direction they bank. What's the relative speed of the outside plane versus the inside plane? Faster. Exactly. So the outside has to be faster than the inside. So how do you create that coordination? That's the reason why we do the drills, the flamingo drill. Uh, we got, you know, on your channel, there's a great video that, you, that we did a, a year ago or so now. Um, be together drill. You know, um, there's so many things that we already have already online besides the, the, the really getting into the detail. Uh, depending on what your tendencies are. And that's the thing. If, if you have a tendency to spin, you're going to need to do one thing. If you have a tendency to, to slide, well, that's going to be something a little bit different. So, but for me, it's right here. I'm throwing that club through the ball. And it's a through the ball and letting that body go through it. That starts the downswing for me. What about you? What, what's kind of your trigger? Well, I, a lot of times I do need to feel a little bit of weight or pressure in the uh in the lead leg so that so that i have something to swing against but then for but then for sure it's think about what starts the down swing i just yeah. create the shot i create that feeling okay so one of the, the most common rebuttal to that tiger woods 2000 stuff have higher rotational hip speed than the met mm -hmm. but driving distance is not great 
Because again, if, if golf swing is more of an upper body motion. You, you look at the strength of, of throughout the years of Nicholas, uh, uh, Norman, uh, Woods, you know, the great drivers of the golf ball, Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson's like 6'4", got long arms. I mean, you know, uh, when I taught Jeff Black, 6'6", six, six, you know, long arms can throw the ball a long way. You see pitchers and quarterbacks, Romo and John Smoltz, being great golfers because of the throwing motion. So um, it's a byproduct, it's a result. So if I'm Dustin Johnson, I got a strong grip. I got to be more open and tilted in order to keep the face square. So that's an effect. If I'm square with my hips and I have a real strong grip, I know when I was working with Paul Eisinger, same thing. If I kept his hips back, oh, he'd snap up the heck out of the ball. He had to open up more as a result of his grip. Um, you look at, I got some pictures I'm, I'm going to start putting up there from Hogan uh, of what he did versus what he said he did. Two different things. Why? Because the grip alignments are different. So we have to take a look and understand grip alignments and how that affects club face and then how that affects what the body's doing. So I think a lot of it, also there is some issues with IMU sensors. Uh, now that that's what we're looking at, we're looking at the drift that's in it, you know, the mocap system, the Vicon system, we're using. So when you say, when you say IMU, is that, is that the, the inertial based ones rather yeah, than the- Yeah, the inertial based ones. So those are the yeah. KVS ones. Um, you know, inertial measurement units are, are what they are. So you have, like in this building, that in my lab I'm in right now, there's steel walls, there's magnetic forces. Well, that's going to have some issue with some of the sensors. Also, one of the other things that doesn't happen with it um, is it doesn't, if, if all of a sudden it doesn't, if, if all of a sudden there's movement in the sensor itself, well, that's going to show up on the graph. But that doesn't mean the hips are moving. And a lot of times the KVS initially was just a three degrees of freedom. So if I'm up here or down here, I can read the same number. So it's not really addressing and measure, accurately measuring it. Now, I know they've improved. I know they've gone to a six DOS system. But really when we start looking into it, I think it's uh, some older data. I think it has to do with a lot of shot patterns. So for a while, the guys on tour were believing a fade was more controllable than a draw. So I think it's... Uh, a lot of people will paraphrase or kind of pick out things and focus in on that. Yeah, I think the, the other thing with the hips being really open and impact, they, they would, in transition, becoming better and better athletes. I mean, look at the guy who won the last two U.S. Opens. The guy's like, he could probably play any sport. So oh, Exactly, yeah. Okay, so let, let's go to more of your questions, guys. All right, so somebody says, uh, with that Tiger Woods fix, and a lot of people said that, they said that that was a personal Harmon fix for a, par a problem Tiger had battled with his entire career of getting stuck and flipping. This is not something that applies to all golfers. Um, and then talks more about the hips being open and impact. So, so what do you th what, now? Is this is that arms first feeling that Tiger had? And even Tiger in the interview said that now this would be a terrible thing for almost every other golfer, but it's what I'm working on personally. Now, that's the only part to that that I had disagreed with because I think it was more universal than that. What do you think about this being not just something for the stuck pro, but something more universal? Oh, it's, it's, it's completely more universal. I mean, if we look at most golfers, they over-rotate, club gets thrown out, they slice, the ball goes nowhere. The mm -hmm. forces are going left. It's a complete swipe. So, and one thing that yeah, we have to understand you're right, they're better athletes, but their, their muscle coordination is so well developed. So a lot of times they're not feeling their arm swing as much because why? That's, that club awareness, that proprioception we have here is so well defined that they're not feeling it. So it's something that they actually have to use their body to keep up with their arms. So now it becomes a conversation, oh, I gotta use my hips more, why? Because my arms are so fast, the club head speed's faster. So if the club head speeds faster, arm swings faster, the hands are moving faster relative to what an amateur does. But all they hear is, well, I gotta use more of my body. And now they throw their body into it, but it doesn't move the golf club. So I think it does, it's a universal description because also when we talk about effort and you ask, and I've been now had fortunate opportunity to, to do presentations in Australia, talk with golfers in Japan, with inside the lab, I've now been done to Sweden, 
not physically, but digitally. Sweden and Australia were the last two phone calls, uh, FaceTimes. And we all know, and everyone's in agreement, your best shots take the least amount of effort. So that means there's more, better muscle coordination. Mm -hmm. The poor shots take a lot of effort. Well, what is effort? Effort is muscle contraction. Like you said, when you freeze up in tense, everything's locked in, you can't move, it doesn't produce a good shot. So when we have tension from the body, that's most of that mass trying to move the body, but it doesn't move the golf club results in a poor shot. All right, so Mike Moore, who's watching live, has a question. He says, with the throw, does your right hand face the sky early in the downswing? I've seen that, that move talked about a little bit. The right hand, early in the downswing, is the right hand still facing the sky? No, but I, I don't, it, it, I would say we, it would have to be a weird, you know, very strong position or grip wise. Like if you're holding a, a, pizza, a pizza or a waiter's tray and yeah, you're just no, putting I mean, it straight down. Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, when we look at that, I would say probably not the sky. It may be just because it depends on range of motion of your wrist joint, depends on your, your inclination of your path. But because it sits on a tilted incline, you know, we look at the swing kind of being, we'll use a, a planer as a representation, even though the club head doesn't swing on a pure plane. It's tilted, so I don't see it being to a sky as much as it's more out out and then down type of thing and then forward okay michael green who's watching live tony says where do we draw the line between speed generation and ball striking consistency i think the history of the body swing or swinging with the big muscles is to eliminate any extra variables the arms and hands to maintain consistency so tony uh, are, are i'm so glad you asked that question because this is my this is my my kind of canned response to that Brendan, you ever been to the dentist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Did they use their big muscles or were they using the fine muscles to clean your teeth and do the work? Definitely the fine muscles, right? You mm -hmm. also have surgery. So this idea, this, yeah, you hold a pen, pencil, whatever. This idea that you're going to have to have the big muscles be dependable is just, I hate to be this, this dramatic, but it's ludicrous. It doesn't make sense. It's a skill. I'm a surgeon. I'm doing fine work. I mean, there we got to be precise. When you're talking about life and death situations, let's, let's really think about this and get this thought cleaned up. Life and death, if I'm nervous because I'm using my small muscles to do surgery, um, then we got a disaster. But no, they're very calm, very precise. You know, uh, it, it's just such a cliche. Uh, let the wild, wild west of golf instruction. It doesn't even make logical sense at all. I hate to be that dramatic with it, but uh, it's got to be said. Got to be said. Okay, one of our longtime Be Better golfers, Kyle, is saying sometimes when he uses the throw feel, he seems to turn the toe down with the driver. How does the right hand work through impact with driver? Yeah, so now understand that the design of the driver, the club head, shafts behind the face so we don't want this isn't a throwing motion rotation that would cause the club face to close so if i could do this and i'm letting that go from extension to flexion the face isn't rotating but if i go this way i'm not swinging my arm at all because you can see my hands my arms not moving i'm just rotating the face so that's something that uh, you have to just control the face if you control the hand, you can control the face. Here's a great question uh, that I thought of a long time ago that I, that I haven't thought about in a while. LJ says, what are your thoughts on most top players having a bent right arm at impact? Or better, what caused that? Is uh, is the action, uh, if, it, if the action is throwing, wouldn't it be straight at impact? No, it, it, if you take a look at the next couple of frames after, you would see the throwing motion because the research says that this motion straightening isn't putting any force into the golf swing. So to me, that's just part of the process because we're looking at a one moment in a very short period of time. So uh, we got to be careful with positionings at impact. 
when you see someone at impact with two arms that are just locked up dead straight, what does that tell you about what probably happened in their transition, Tony? Um, I think that they're racing, trying to get the club head back to the ball. So their bodies generally have gone out. And we say generally, because again, you got this kind of this spectrum here. Bodies raced out. Now they're just trying to get the club head back to the ball the best they can. Okay, guys, uh, a couple of announcements in uh, this video I wanted to say. We have two more spots available at the Be Better Golf Scoring School at Industry Hills in Industry Hills, California, Industry Hills Golf Club with Tim Yelverton. Tim is the best short game instructor in the world, in my opinion. And we have just two more spots available in the afternoon session. And uh, that's July 28th. So send me an email, contact. And uh, that's July 28th. So send me an email, contact bebettergolf at gmail.com for details. You can go over to bebettergolf.net slash school. And uh, we've seen some amazing improvements with uh, people dropping their handicaps in half uh, like Don did or uh, 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 my friend Ray also who's gone to the school and is coming back has also um, just done amazing things with their scoring. Another place we've seen awesome improvements is at our Be Better Golf uh, Full Game School. So uh, we're not officially announcing it yet, but for you live guys, we will tell you about this thing that we have in the works in Atlanta. Tony, tell us a little bit about what's going to be going on in Atlanta on August, I think it's 8th, 19th. Exactly. And over at uh, Old Atlanta Golf Club, uh, Grant Records, the head pro, and he's going to be helping us out. So we're going to have three of us there doing golf instruction. We're really looking at the high tech things. We're creating these video practice stations. So, Brendan, I know you use the cones real well and, and a lot of artificial devices, which are great. We're actually going to see if we can digitize those and create perfect practice stations. So we're using the foresight and some other technology that we're bringing in. Um, we're gonna have some, some very interesting practice stations. So this way, if you do things right every single time, your improvement should, and obviously that acceleration and improvement will be there. And also we're gonna take a look at how to increase more club head speed. We're gonna take a look at what are the, some of the exercises or different things you can do using some pure motion and golf stick pro, some different objects to create a lot higher club head speed with less effort. I think one of the exciting things about our upcoming Be Better Golf School in Atlanta is that we're basically going to have the golf course to, we'll yes. have the range, but we'll, we'll also be able to make that transition that you, you can't always do, especially if you're not a member at a private club that's like empty all the time. We're going to basically have the entire golf course to do these shots. Tony, what do you think people always ask? What do you think the, the difference is to get your shots to the course, and how will we be able to do that at the school? Well, the good thing is, is we'll be able to just take the groups out. We'll have pretty much a, a old Atlanta as a private club, so that's one thing. And then being able to have the opportunity to go out there and basically isolate ourselves to work off driving. So if we, if we can put the ball in the fairway, and then our swings in better, so our proximity to the hole is closer. Guess what? We've now done what we can could from the full swing standpoint. Now you just got to make the putt. And obviously, see Tim. He's phenomenal. He's up at West Point right here. So to me, go to Tim, get that dialed in. Come see us. We'll get the full swing dialed in, and you'll have that's about the best you can get right there. Okay, guys, so for information about our Atlanta Golf School on July 8th, um, sorry, on August, August 18th, 19th, contact BeBetterGolf at gmail.com. I haven't even put up any information on the website yet about it, but I will uh, probably in the next week or so. But jump ahead of the line and send me an email about it and just let me know that you're interested and we'll, we'll give you the details uh, uh, where it is, price, and everything else, who, who's helping us with it. All right, Tony, so we're going to go to two more questions before we sign off here. Uh, Garrett says, like this. so that's one thing I would check out because really, if I go this way, the face is staying square the whole time. So this is actually just a square face. It's not close. It's just square to its path. And so the only thing I can think of is maybe there's some manipulation that's going this way when that but it really, when that, but it really shouldn't be shut at the top. So we'd have to uh, to a five from a ten last year. Wow. Okay, so that the that's cool. So come see us July twenty eighth if you want to work work on that. Okay, final question, Tony. I'm gonna go back to the 
the other video to, to see the this tiger video to see. Uh, not that one. The interesting thing about the comments, Tony, was in the in the first ten thousand views, that was mostly be better golfers, and it was for thirty years now. Okay, so here here's a comment that that is pretty uh, indicative of some of the answers to this. Uh, most power. Uh, this this D says. Most power comes from the ground and the forces created by the lower body, feet, etc., and the ground pushing into the ground. Don't believe me? Question mark. Imagine how far you'd hit the ball if you were suspended above the ground and had only your upper body to create the power and distance. And then in all caps, he says, power comes from the ground. Like Hogan said, the lower body starts the downswing exclamation point, And then that, the exclamation points go on for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just... <laughs> It's such a misconception and a misapplication of science. Yes, we need friction. So if I'm on the ground, let's say I'm in a, a bunker. That was the reason why that tiger shot that he hit at the Canadian Open was brilliant. I mean, it was just unbelievable how far he hit a six iron. He's in a soft ground material and was able to create the speed. Most people, if they would have been trying to hit that shot, would have buried them, the club in the bunker because they would have tried to move the body. So we use the ground as resistance. We need friction. We need resistance. The ground provides that. But the ground does not provide any force upward. Zero. If I, if I don't grab the... Uh, I think we lost Tony a little bit. Yeah, okay. I think we lost Tony a little bit, guys. I'm going to try to call him back. Uh, just hold on just a second, because this was, this was good. I like that part. FaceTime Tony Litzak. Oh, there you are, Tony. Hey, yeah, I'm you're, sorry. You're yeah. You're right. counter, counter move. So that you can throw the, the hands very, very fast. So he talks about, you know, that that stop shot and you, just, you stop. So you have to kind of brace yourself, like actively put 